On the evening of January 12, 1865, a very unusual meeting took place on Macon Street in Savannah, Georgia. There, on the second floor parlor of the Charles Green Mansion, Secretary of War Edward M. Stanton and Union General William T. Sherman met with 20 of the city's black ministers to discuss what some historians now call the nation's first act of reconstruction. Although a Union victory was still months away, General Sherman's march to the sea and subsequent capture of Savannah on December 21st made the possibility of a Confederate defeat a tangible reality. So significant was the capture of Georgia's coastal city that Sherman quickly dispatched a telegram to President Lincoln, writing, I beg to present you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah. Although victory seemed all but certain, the more immediate problem of what to do with the tens of thousands of black refugees who had followed Sherman's march gave the federal government a small glimpse into larger, more complicated issues of a post-war South. The meeting held between Stanton, Sherman, and the black ministers in Savannah that January night would ultimately symbolize both the perils and promises of Reconstruction in the United States. The purpose of the meeting was for Sherman and Stanton to gather information on how freedmen understood the war and how they imagined their future in a post-war America. Among the guests of Sherman and Stanton that evening were several freeborn men and ex-slaves, including 41-year-old Ulysses L. Houston, a former slave and pastor of the Third African Baptist Church. Also present, Jason Lynch, a 26-year-old freeborn African-American from Baltimore and a missionary to the South, and 67-year-old Garrison Frazier. Frazier was born in Granville County, North Carolina, and labored as a slave until he bought his and his wife's freedom in 1857. Frazier served as a minister for the Baptist Church for over 35 years, and perhaps because of his age and experience, Frazier was chosen by his fellow ministers to act as the representative and spokesperson of the group. During the meeting, Stanton and Sherman asked Frazier and his peers a series of questions, including what they understood as the motives behind the Civil War and how they interpreted the Emancipation Proclamation. Sherman and Stanton then posed the following question to Frazier and the ministers. In what manner you think you can take care of yourselves, and how can you best assist the government in maintaining your freedom? Frazier answered, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. Stanton and Sherman next asked the group whether freed slaves would rather be integrated into the Southern society or if they would rather live independently among themselves. Frazier answered for the group, I would prefer to live by ourselves for there is a prejudice against us in the South that would take years to get over. When polled individually around the table, all but one, Jason Lynch, the man from Baltimore, said that they agreed with Frazier. Based on the conversation that took place that evening on January 16, 1865, William T. Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15. In this extraordinary document, Sherman declares, The islands from Charleston South the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea and the country bordering the St. John's River, Florida, are reserved and set apart for the settlement of Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the President of the United States. Sherman further orders that, quote, each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground in the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. Sherman would later informally suggest to his troops that they lend the new settlers mules to work the land. Thus was born the now famous phrase, 40 acres and a mule. Upon Sherman's order, 400,000 acres of land, including Georgia's Sea Islands and the mainland 30 miles in from the coast, were redistributed to newly freed slaves. Although historians debate the motivations behind the field order, 
There is no doubt that many African Americans and radical Republicans felt Sherman's military decree had the potential to reshape and redefine the American South, land ownership, and racial relations. As historian Eric Foner argues, here in coastal South Carolina and Georgia, the prospect beckoned of a transformation of Southern society more radical even than the end of slavery. Indeed, for African Americans, the shock wave of Special Field Order No. 15 reverberated throughout the South. By June of 1865, over 40,000 freedmen had been resettled on what was often referred to as Sherman's Land. Among the new settlers was Baptist minister Ulysses L. Houston, one of the ministers that had met with Sherman and Stanton back in January. Houston led 1,000 African Americans to Skidaway Island, where they established a self-governing community with Houston serving as governor. Tunis Campbell, another new settler, became superintendent of the Georgia Islands for the Freedmen's Bureau. Under Campbell, St. Catherine's Island became a separatist democracy of 400 African Americans with its own constitution, Congress, and court system. Although Special Field Order No. 15 had the potential to revolutionize the South, after the war ended, Sherman's order proved contentious as the federal government tried to sort out how it would deal permanently with what Sherman had instituted as a temporary military order. Following the assassination of President Lincoln, any promise of equality through land ownership was lost. Lincoln's successor, President Andrew Johnson, ordered the confiscated lands returned to their former white owners. Most African Americans had no alternative except return to work for the plantation owners, which eventually gave rise to the brutal and unfair system of sharecropping and debt peonage. Although politicians and historians still debate the motives of Sherman, as well as the ramifications of Special Field Order No. 15, there is no doubt that the order itself was born from the hopes and dreams expressed by those 20 black ministers that met with Sherman and Stanton that January evening on Macon Street. In Special Field Order No. 15, many African Americans saw an opportunity of empowerment through access to land, a chance to own their own labor, and the freedom to choose their own destiny.